Uh, thanks for your presentation. Uh, Minister, um, for anybody that will be going around rural Ireland or, or through farms, uh, every day there's white thorn and there's different types of trees and farms right around this country. Um, not one of them is allowed in our sequestration. Uh, and I'm wondering why or why hasn't government made some move on that. Um, in the line of um, we call raised bog, there's a lot of forestry was planted years ago uh, on the raised bog. And I know that first of all you'd have wind blowing it because it wouldn't take the root properly. But there's still an obligation on that raised bog to replant it, which seems to be flying in the face mm. of what um, Minister Bruton says. Um, does the department or is the department looking into, we, we would see situations where people would get a company to come in and to an accredited company to plant their trees or do the mound and do the whole job for them and they look after it for basically a stabilisation period of three years or whatever. But if there's problems after that, they seem to be gone into the sunset. And is there any clauses there that can be, uh, that the department can make them more accountable? Um, in the line of the carbon credits, I would agree with Merton Kinney and, and, and Deputy Cahill. The, the reason there was a grant given for forestry and tax breaks was word and to get people to grow. It's simple as that. There is no part of the document that states that the carbon credits is owned by anybody or that there's a clause in it that the government has it. And I would like to see your reply back on that. Um, the other thing, Minister, <coughs> we would have seen a few cases that forests might be sown for 10 or 12 years. And with this new adjustment or reassessment with satellite, um, the area might have come down and there's clawbacks being done. Now, I'm a contractor and if a fellow paid me to mow a field and said there was 11 acres in it 12 years ago, and it ended up that there was 10 and a half, well, <laughs> he wouldn't be getting money back, or if it was vice versa, I wouldn't be getting it. So I don't know how um, a clawback up to 12 years can be done. Is there any consideration in the department um, that you'd look at designation in a county, and like Leitrim, you know, there is a lot to talk about Leitrim, but every other county, this isn't just one county. Is there anything that where we'd look at the designation of a the amount of designation in an area, um, rivers, lakes, and see what percentage then is in the actual uh, areas? Are you disappointed, and as Deputy Cal pointed out, and rightly so as well, <coughs> Quilch haven't blessed themselves in glory with the, you know, they have actually put a bad taste in the mouth of a lot of farmers with the contracts and the way they handled it. Has your department done anything to basically give a bit of a boot to what they're doing? And Minister, um, years ago when we were young, and that's a while ago, um, there was a thing called a shelter belt in every field. Um, on a bad day, you might see cattle in round it. There might be 50 trees in a corner or 80 trees. Why doesn't there be some sort of innovative idea that if you put 50 or 100 trees and 100 there, whichever trees you saw, I'm not saying that you have to saw one or other, um, and that every thousand trees was put down as an acre, that it, you gained ground, or along by ditches if you if you wanted to put them, or up in the ditch. Um, this was done years ago, um, and look, look, we cut them because the EU actually gave grants to knock every ditch in the place in the 80s and 90s, and take every tree out of it. And why isn't there sort of an innovative thinking that it's not just that you have to put it in one corner or one one field as such that we need to... Now, I would, uh, you know, one thing ca I'd caution, you mentioned rivers there, you want to make sure, and that would take up a fair bit of area, um, you want to make sure if you're doing it along by a river that you leave place for cleaning the river, which means that a machine has to go along by it and then you're three outside it, which would take, take up space. I, I would caution that you would watch that. The other thing, Minister, there is a problem. I see an instance, and it's not the department's fault, where trees were sown um, and there was no grant drawn on them, but they were nearly coming in a person's house because it's the Maryland land. And there's nothing can be done, to be quite honest about it. There's nothing, um, and these people, their light has been blocked out. Setback distances are crucial, and there is a fear among people, and this is a genuine fear, and this isn't people being alarmist, 
if forestry goes nearly around your house, if a fire ever breaks out, you're, you're in trouble. And I think that we need to make sure there's a lot of things, and there will be forestry, let no one, you know, there will be forestry around Ireland, and it isn't that people are against it, but some of the ways, that, and I know that you are doing things or trying to do things different with um, bringing in broadleafs and all that. Um, if we don't address the problems that were there, then you won't get people um, on board. And there were just the questions I have for you, Minister. Thanks, Deputy. That's the last question. Now, Minister, there's a, quite a very variety of questions there. Uh, if you can answer as many as possible, and if do not, you may come back to the committee. I'll do my best. Um, Please. If people bear with me. And if I have forgotten any, just remind me and I'll try and address it. Deputy Corbin Kennedy was first. Just um, it, the, it's, it's a helpful coincidence, I think, that the CAP programme and the new afforestation programme are going to run sort of in tandem. And certainly, I've always said that they need to give regard to each other. So the internal preparation for the next uh, afforestation programme is underway within the department. Um, you asked about the likes of CRAN and others being involved. And yes, certainly there is an opportunity there in some of the community-led schemes. And the neighbourhood scheme is a scheme that's in place uh, so that publicly owned, uh, community owned uh, um, initiatives, and I've seen them at home and I've seen them in, in County Mayo and in other places, uh, neighbourhood schemes where the department support the uh, creation of a neighbourhood in public space, which allows for an educational um, dimension to it, where sp sp specifically native trees and broadleaves in particular are actually identified and marked along the way, for instance, and it's, it's part of the whole Slenus Lodge, you know, healthy um, activities. Um, so that's, that is an initiative that's there. With regard to TAMS, like TAMS has, has been exclusively um, I think there's seven different TAMS measures. It's been exclusively for farmers up to now, but I think it's something in terms of the review of the cap that it should be considered. There is specialist equipment for removal of, you know, not your standard uh, um, equipment that maybe could be considered uh, as part of it. Um, grassland replanting. Yeah, um, the, re the replanting obligation is there um, as part of it's an afforestation program. It's meant to increase the net area, uh, so to, to put land back in grassland, notwithstanding the ash dieback position, or maybe some other exceptional circumstances where land isn't suitable, um, is is a consideration. But in general, the replanting obligation is in place because it's an afforestation program. Uh, Senator Mulhern, um, the application system um, does regard uh, designations of areas. So, if it's an SAC or an Natura site, if there's a presence of habitats, um, there has to be consideration and regard. County development plans are considered. Um, and there is a, a site notice under the new Act uh, since 2004, the 2014 Act. But, um, the enabling legislation has been in place for, I think, two years now, um, mm -hmm. and that the um, site notice has to be put up. There's a 28-day. There is an opportunity to put in a submission. There is an opportunity to make an appeal. There is an independence appeals office, um, and the roads applications are now being for non-national uh, our motorways, but all other roads, with the exception of onto those. Um, is part of the planning process is now being incorporated into um, the Department of uh, under the, uh, pl the application system that's in place. The 60 metre dwelling, uh, the 60 metre setback from a dwelling can be increased in certain circumstances um, where seen appropriate. Next was yeah. Deputy yeah. Cahill. Um, okay, yeah. You asked a range of questions, Deputy. Um, uh, hedgerows, uh, I suppose, hedgerows haven't been included in the system, but there is an argument 
uh, for including them. If you take GLOSS and EOS schemes over the last number of years under environmental schemes, I think probably close to 4,000 kilometres of new hedgerows have been reinstated. Um, are in, in, in stated there has been coppicing, there have been other measures which, which have been taken place, and I would accept that hedgerows could be and should be as part of our biodiversity and carbon sequestration. They're certainly considered in any event, regardless of the type of, of plantation, to be better areas of storing bio, bio, biodiverse stores or, or reservoirs than either broadleaf or conifer plantations. I think that's something that I read and heard stated, um, and I've no reason to disagree with it. Um, the tax incentive, um, I suppose to say it's accepted, yes, it was to encourage people, and 85 per cent of the three billion that has been spent has been, has been spent on like, sugar funding since 1990 has gone to farmers, and it has been successful we have 300,000 hectares more than we had in 1990 in the system. <clears throat> it has slowed down for a number of reasons. Um, one was, I suppose, at the outset, it was the low-hanging fruit. There was areas of land that were um, uh, readily available. There are competing demands. There's tax uh, incentives now for long-term leasing. We've seen an expansion in the dairy system. We have, um, in spite of some people's position, we have seen stricter guidelines and more stringent um, assessment and in the approval process, which some would say has, has slowed it down, but others, others will argue isn't restrictive enough. Um, and we've seen uh, designations of lands such as the Hen Harriers, Freshwater, Power Muscle, Acid Sensitivity, and others come into place, which actually have made it more, um, uh, I suppose, onerous to actually get a, an approval, and it has needed resourcing with archaeologists in the department, of which two new extra have been recruited, an ongoing recruitment of, of geologists, I think, as well. Um, um, but it is something that's immovable. We have to move with and evolve with. With regard to the hen harrier, um, you outlined the research or the studies that have shown that with a proper uh, um, uh, ticket mix, as they call it, so anything from pre-ticket to post to first thinning and onwards, that if you get the balance right, you can have a healthy environment with forestry at a certain level in plantations, and certainly an argument that we have made and have submitted to National Parks and Wildlife uh, Service and would advocate that we can actually allow for controlled, managed in afforestation in Hen Harrier zones. But the full um, approval of that lies outside of our department's control at the moment and will continue to lie outside our control for that matter. But it's something that we would agree with that can be managed sensibly. Um, certainly, I don't see why we shouldn't. On Clearfell timelines, I'm not sure what it was you asked that question. 83% of uh, are approved within four months, 93% within six months, and the year-to-date approvals are up 270%. There's been a, a significant ramping up, and one archaeologist has been full-time on approvals on felling licences applications, sorry. Um, but we have an appeals process on that and on roads and on um, um, approvals for planting. So the new legislation hasn't been without its challenges in terms of resources um, in, in, in trying to make sure that the system works. So going back to the question that was asked earlier about um, you know, making the system work better, and Deputy Penrose asked about Scotland. We certainly need to look at all the, if we can compare like with like and what lessons we can learn from from their system. But administration is, is certainly, um, and the, the processing of it is something that we're conscious that needs to be worked on all the time. Um, Is the time frame for making the time, Minister? 
Sorry? The time frame for the permission, the plan, what time frame is there for, the, for those applications? We've turned around this year. The AFAR, um, I have the stats here. I'll come back to you on that. Right, um, I have them here. Maybe you'd help Senator me. Lombard, Senator Lombard. Uh, Senator Lombard. Oh, yeah, OK. On, on Moor Park, there was a Chagas village. There was the Department of People from Afforestation. Senator, definitely Tom Dowling was there um, from Chagas advocating forestry. Every green cert has a module on afforestation. Most knowledge transfers, I, stand, I can't say definitively that the dairy knowledge transfer discussion groups are, but the others are certainly, and the ambition is that every discussion group would have a module on considering forestry. It's part of the Chagas plan. I would expect that it will be all implemented in the, in, over the course of the next year. But certainly for green certs uh, courses, that it does form part of, of that course, a module on considering planting trees as part of the farm enterprise, not instead of, um, not as an either or situation. And um, which goes to um, a point, well, I'll come back to it, um, that uh, um, Senator, uh, Deputy Fitzmaurice made about <coughs> shelter bells. Um, on the, by the, that was yours, Dep Deputy McConnell, I think, was next. Just on the, on the diverse species, so the afforestation programme 2014 to 2020 sought to um, have a 30% broadleaf mix. One of the reasons why it was difficult to, to get approval for any more than 20% unenclosed land was that we weren't hitting that target. So we undertook a mid-term review in 2017 and published and, and enacted the recommendations of that in 2018, which included enhanced um, payments and incentives for broadleaves. And we've seen in, in, in the course of that year percentage of broadleaves go from 22 per cent approximately up to about 28, and the indications are that it's 28 and maybe closer to 30 this year. So that's been the incentives. Every plantation, the monoculture plantation system does not exist anymore. We have native woodland schemes. We have a woodland environment fund, which actually is going to involve the private sector, uh, corporates or whatever, as part of their corporate social responsibility, paying a landowner a one-off payment on top of the establishment grant and the premiums to plant a native woodland scheme. We have a woodland improvement scheme where we um, and a continuous cover forestry schemes, incentives in place. So there are a range of measures and they're listed. Um, and I actually picked this up down at Moor Park, uh, Senator, which is the Chagas uh, Forestry Programme 2014 to 2020. So that's where I picked it up uh, last week. My issue as chairman was how are you going to change the ethos between beef and dairy farmers in particular yeah. to get them into the system of the idea of having a percentage of your holding? And I ask you that question, what do you deem will be a percentage of a holding that a beef or dairy farmer well, should be looking at? Just going back just to the, Because yeah. I think the ethos between a dairy farmer and a beef farmer and what, how they look at forestry mm. mentally more than anything else is a huge issue. Yeah. And it how go, can we goes, change that? Uh, I, yes, and that is the challenge. And like, I, I think if you look at some of the um, suggestions that have come out of the Commission with regard to uh, initiatives such as Trees for Kids, plant a hectare. We have 120,000 um, farmers, roughly, in the country. If half of them decided to plant a hectare each, that's 60,000 hectares. That's just one hectare each. That could be a broadleaf. It could be along a river, a riparian mm -hmm. margin. And we have initiatives like Woodlands for Water. To, so we have, there's, in it, working with the Department of the Environment with regard to protecting water, <coughs> in terms of water framework directives and uh, nutrient management plans to stop a uh, nutrient runoff. And there are a range of options out there. Shelter, Deputy Fitzmaurice mentioned shelter. Um, 
And shelter last year would have been shade from the sun, not shelter from the wind. You know, so like, let's be honest. Yeah. It could have been, it would have been maybe as advantageous <coughs> to have had a little, a little bit of a canopy on your border to stop your animals getting parched and sunburnt. You know, um, and I'm not being facetious when I say that. But I mean, I think we do need to look at that, um, and that's part of the mindset. But also. No more than the, the Woodland Environment Fund is corporate social responsibility. Farmers, every farm almost, without exception, has the ability to put assign some of their land into trees, be it commercial uh, spruce, which will have a 15 per cent diverse species, or be it a broadleaf coppice area, smaller areas, <coughs> excuse me, and feel that they have actually understand that they they're getting it established and a premium for it for nothing. For others, it could be forest for fibre, for the bioenergy. Um, so we have a range of options there, and I'd encourage people to promote it in a positive way. We all need to work together on this, um, and in the end of the day, it helps us achieve uh, what we set out under those three pillars: efficiency, a displacement, and sequestration from the agriculture sector. It's the biggest single incentive we can take, but it doesn't have to be giant steps. It can be small steps for a lot of people. And for some then, and I accept fully, because it's come across a number of times, the need for Quilcha and Bordnamona and other state agencies to come on board and to be more engaged. And I accept that the, 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 the um, record and the experience that some people had with regard to the um, contracts were not very good because there was, a, there was a, a range of different contracts. And I think last year in particular, the former uh, CEO of Quilcia made a concerted effort to ensure that every single contractor, con farmer that was con contracted, whichever arrangement was in place, was contacted to see if it could be resolved. And certainly they were anxious from a PR perspective to become good partners again. Um, so we see Quilcha as being a key player in the afforestation to get to that 8,000 hectares. We see scope for the likes of Bordenamona and other state publicly owned mon um, lands to play their part in that. And it'll be a mix on appropriate, appropriate, the right tree on the right land in the right place. That's what it is all about. Um, and it's not a one-size-fits-all, it can't be. Uh, the carbon sequestration value uh, is something that's sometimes um, debated, that broad leaves are better than conifers. Um, in actual fact, it works out roughly the same. Uh, because they're evergreen, um, conifers will store for more longer every year, but then their ro rotation is quicker. But they lock in, to lock in carbon. The, the um, technology now is allowing for the brush from the forest, from, the, uh, from clear fall situations, once it's dried out, to be used to, to, be used to um, uh, generate uh, heat and power in, in the likes of um, milk, uh, dairy processing plants and others, uh, and leave it cleaner. Uh, so, uh, area to work on for replanting and more efficient. So there's lots we can do there when we look at the, the range of um, options. We can build a bioeconomy here that can displace fossil-based uh, products right across a range of areas. But I think we need to get everybody talking in a positive way, and we all need to play our part. And I'm not lecturing anybody here, but there are a range of options. So when we think trees, we don't think one species in every situation. We think what's best here, what can work. And we can certainly improve the water quality, the aesthetics, uh, help the environment, and increase the income and the value for, for landowners. And I accept that you're going to hear from people after me about Ash Dieback and the experience, and we are determined to try and address that and learn from the lessons that were, uh, the mistakes that were made um, to make it a better scheme. Because we need positive experiences. Uh, Deputy McConnell asked about the onset of um, 
the, the volume of, of timber that's going to come on um, board. By 2035, we estimate that it, uh, it is estimated that the roundwood harvest will be double what it was in 2015, and all of that increase will virtually come from the private estate. In 2018, for the first time ever, the amount of um, product that came from the private estate ex exceeded 1 million cubic metres. That's, that's the beginning of it. I would anticipate that as that pro increases, that the experience of people who have been selling um, timber will be positive, and they'll see that this was actually a very lucrative and valuable um, enterprise, and they were quite happy to reinstate our land back into plantations, uh, into trees again, and that it becomes that becomes a good news story. So word them out. Hopefully, we'll have a positive, um, you know, communication for, amongst people who've actually been involved in it. So we've a bit to go. Um, I think it's 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 um, an area that I think can contribute a lot to the rural environment, uh, to our carbon uh, climate change obligations and, and effort, and also to the economies of rural areas. There's 12,000 jobs in this. We export 330 million into, particularly into the UK. The UK is second only to, to China in terms of imports of, of timber. It's hard to believe. We export 70% of what we produce timber products into the UK. It only accounts for 7% of their imports. So it's a very important market to us, and there's huge potential. And at the moment, we're importing from Scotland. Uh, timber to service that market, be it for pulp or sawlock, because we currently, our, our processors aren't sure of enough of supply, but that will improve. And hopefully there's a positive um, forecast on the value of that timber that's in, in many holdings across the country at the moment. The average hectare is probably less than 10 hectares, um, uh, 21,000, 22,000 private owners in the country.